Welcome to HMS Collingwood Heritage Collection Virtual Tour for the Gosport Heritage Open Days, September 2020. I thought I would take this opportunity to let you see a very large painting that hangs in the wardroom at the officer's mess of HMS Collingwood. The painting depicts the life of Admiral Cuthbert Collingwood. If you start on the left in this photograph, you'll see him uh, being selected to join the Navy. You can see a picture of his mother, the fact he fought in Bunker Hill, that he met Nelson. In the second photograph, you'll see the rest of his life after the Battle of Trafalgar, where he was second in command to Nelson. Collingwood was born in Northumberland, but spent very little of his time there. There is a museum in the house that he used to live in, in Morpeth in Northumberland, and is well worth a visit. Collingwood spent most of his life at sea. And when he died, he was buried in the crypt of St Paul's Cathedral. The collection was formed in 1953 by Instructor Lieutenant Commander Cyril Sinfield, who saw too much equipment going in the skip and decided to set up a museum. At that time, he had approximately 10 pieces of hardware, 20 or 30 photographs, and half a dozen books. The collection now consists of over 1,200 pieces of equipment, several thousand photographs, and 143 linear meters of documents. HMS Collingwood was commissioned in December 1939 as a new entry training establishment for hostilities only ratings. At its peak there were some 10,000 people in HMS Collingwood and the intake was in the order of a thousand a week. Here we see some of them on divisions in 1943. Here we see five newly joined trainees. They have pledged allegiance to the King, they are wearing RN name bands, and alongside them are their training staff. They are standing outside the typical wooden huts that were built throughout Collingwood in the very early 1940s. Ten weeks later, three of the five trainees are leaving HMS Collingwood bound for the fleet. They have learned how to wear their uniform, they have learned of naval discipline and some basic seamanship. They are now off to their first ship. Collingwood did not avoid enemy bombing during the Second World War, and this is a tail fin from one of the bombs dropped early on in 1940. Now let's move on and look at some of the wireless and radar equipment that is in the collection. The Royal Navy discovered during exercises that they were unable to identify their own torpedo boats returning from mission from those of the enemy. They asked their officers if they could come up with methods of identification. A number of some were suggested, but none were successful. Then Commander Henry Bradwardine Jackson suggested the use of what were then called Hurchin waves, what we would today call wireless or radio waves. He did these trials from HMS Defiance, which was anchored off Salt Ash in Cornwall. And by 1896, he was able to transmit signals between Defiance and a steamboat in Devonport at a range of two and a half miles. These two items are replicas of Jackson's equipment. The replicas were built in 1946 in the now HMS Defiance which was down in Devonport although ashore by now. On the left is the transmitter which is a spark transmitter. The spark moved between the balls. The high voltage to make the spark is generated by the coil underneath being interrupted. The one on the right is the receiver. Looks nothing like any receiver you have ever seen before and all it could do was operate a relay to make a bell ring or print on a piece of paper a line representing a dot or a dash. But this was high technology from 1896. 
the Royal Navy took wireless to war in 1900, the first time during the Boer War, and the secondly part of the Boxer Rebellion which took place in China. This photograph shows the type of equipment, or circuit diagrams of the equipment, that would have been used at that time. Building on their experience ashore and in ships, the Royal Navy decided to set up a wireless development department in HMS Vernon, which at the time was located in three ships moored off Whale Island. The ship that most of the work took part in is now HMS Warrior. This photograph shows one of the early portable receivers. Of course, portable in the early 1900s wasn't what we would think of today. Here are the two carts that were required to move around the receiver and the transmitter and the masts. Each of these carts required at least four men to pull them. To ensure worldwide communications, a number of shore wireless stations were built, mainly in British colonies. This board shows a wireless station at Ranella in Malta and the names of the officers in charge from 1910 onwards. Equipment development continued apace and by 1918 the Royal Navy and the Royal Naval Air Service had upwards of 23 different types of transmitters and receivers. This photograph shows one of the shortwave transmitters which was destined for an HM submarine. The two peculiar bottle-like devices on the left hand side are valves. Here we have some pre-World War II wireless equipment, a transmitter and a receiver. They are very large and quite difficult to operate. The user must adjust many dials within a few seconds of each other to get optimum performance. They required skilled and highly trained people to operate them. This is not what was going to be available in World War II. Here we have photographs of three of the many receivers that were used in World War II. A common feature on all of them, though not possibly obvious to you, is that they use a single dial in order to get on frequency, and not the many that you saw in the previous receivers. Not only were these receivers used to listen to Allied transmissions, they were also used to intercept those of the enemy, be they Japanese, Italian or German. The American HRO was very often used for this process. The B-28 less so, but still so. And the American AR-88D was one of the highest grade receivers that was available to the Allies. Radar was unknown before World War II. But development started in 1935. For the Navy, this was along at Eastney Fort East. Their aim was to get a radar set, although they would have called it an RDF set, to detect aircraft. Without the use of one of these sets, you would be lucky to detect an aircraft at 10 miles. With the use of this set, the Type 79, Aircraft at 20,000 feet could be detected at 90 miles and therefore give much more warning to the ship. The units you see in front of you from left to right are a power supply, the transmitter, ancillary controls and the one with the big wheel on it is the receive unit. This wheel turned the antenna around on the top of the mast and pointed in a general direction. It was operated manually and went round 390 degrees and then had to be turned back again. This was due to the way that the aerial was fed from the transmitter. This type of transmitter lasted throughout World War II, although there were some improvements. Before 1939, the Royal Navy was not sure if the German capital ships were fitted with radar or not. After the Battle of the River Plate, which took place in December 1939, the German pocket battleship was scuttled off Montevideo. 
the Royal Navy took the opportunity to send down an Admiralty scientist, Mr Bainbridge Bell, to examine the wreck. Not only did he examine it, but he came back to the United Kingdom with pieces of the German radar. These elements are in the Collingwood Heritage Collection. We see a range unit and a display unit. Bainbridge Bell also did many drawings and wrote a report, this confirming that the Germans did indeed have radar, which was used for ranging their guns. This is the operating console for a gun radar. The three white views you can see allowed the operators to measure range, bearing and altitude. Constant measurement of these allowed rates to be achieved, which could be sent to a mechanical computer. The computer was linked to the anti-aircraft guns and the guns then pointed in the right direction in the sky, allowing for the speed of the target. Before such radars, more than 10,000 rounds might have to be fired in order to knock an aircraft out the sky. With this type of radar and with the proximity fuses, it got down to somewhere in the value of 1 in 25 rounds to knock an aircraft out the sky. The Type 79 radar that we saw in an earlier photograph was far too large to fit into destroyers, frigates and corvettes. It wasn't until the advent of the magnetron in the late 1940 that such sets could be built that were small enough to fit into those small ships. This radar could see a surface U-boat at about 5 miles and the submarine's periscope at about a mile. This allowed much of the Battle of the Atlantic to swing in the Allies' way. The magnetron that I spoke of is the device that you have in your microwave oven and operates on about 10 centimetres. The collection has a number of artefacts that have nothing to do with wireless. The next two slides will show these. This is a portable electrical heater from the Royal Yacht Victoria in Albert. It is silver plated. These are gold plated fittings from the Royal Apartments in the Royal Yacht Victoria in Albert. They also fitted with the original incandescent lamps. Lesser mortals had either brass or silver plated light fittings. Thank you for visiting us today and we hope to see you all in person next year. Please leave your comments on the Gosport Heritage Open Day site.